Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Suburban Rifleman. I'm Greg. Today, I want to take a look at another somewhat unusual and kind of interesting rifle that's in my collection. It's another Mosin Nagant. At one point in time, I was a fairly serious Mosin Nagant collector um, back in the heyday when there were so many rifles being imported and they were so cheap. Um, and I was a single guy without a lot of financial responsibilities. I built up an enormous collection of Mosin-Nagants. I don't know how many passed through my hands over the years, but at one point in time, if I recall correctly, I had 47 different variants uh, in my collection at one point in time. So that'll give you an idea of like how many rifles I used to have. In the intervening years, I kind of got out of it. I sold almost everything off with, uh, I think I was down to just two rifles, two 9130 variants, uh, the Spanish Civil War veteran that we looked at in the last video, and my 9130 PU sniper rifle, which is, I think, all original with no import marks or anything like that on it. We'll almost certainly be looking at that rifle at some point in time. I don't have immediate plans to do that. Um, but about a year or two years ago, I was lamenting to my cousin the fact that I hadn't kept any carbine variants, that I had only kept a couple of rifles. And he informed me that I had given him a couple of carbines many years ago and that I was more than welcome to have one of them back and very graciously gifted me this carbine, which if you look at it at first glance, you can see that there's no uh, attached bayonet, no bayonet lug. So it looks an awful lot like a Model 38, but it is in fact not a Model 38. It's the hotly debated Model 9159. Let's just check and make sure that there's nothing in the chamber, even though I know there isn't, and nothing in the magazine, and no, there is not. This is probably one of the most hotly debated variants of the Mosin-Nagant rifle in the modern collecting community. Its origins, the circumstances under which and the reason behind its manufacture is more or less unknown. Where it came from, what it was for, nobody seems to be able to agree on that. Some folks have even made the case that this thing is completely fraudulent, that it was made up in Russia by some enterprising individuals to try to capitalize on the stock of 9130 rifles that they had at the time to create a new rare variant that would command a premium in price. I don't think that's correct because I was around back in the day. I was buying rifles and these were selling at a slight premium, but you're talking about a few bucks, not an enormous premium. And they didn't come in in such small numbers that they ended up being worth an awful lot of money. And in fact, uh, some collectors will not touch these things with a 10-foot pole because they absolutely believe that they're fraudulent and that they have no value whatsoever. Um, I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm kind of agnostic. I tend to believe the original story because when something is as hotly debated as this is, it's oftentimes best to go back to that original story and give it a bit more credence than you do with all the speculative uh, narratives that come up in the intervening time. Originally, it was said that these rifles were found in Bulgaria. Sentry Arms themselves uh, announced at one point in time that they were found in a warehouse near the Baltic Sea. Now, that could mean anything. They didn't say Bulgaria. Um, but the common opinion was that they were coming out of Bulgaria and the modifications that were made to them were done in Bulgaria. Now, some people like uh, Terence Lapine, whose book is right behind me here somewhere, uh, which is basically the definitive uh, collector's resource on Mosin-Nagant rifles, he says that he believes that the, the work was actually performed in the Soviet Union, um, done by Russian, done at some Russian armory. but. So I don't think we're ever going to know the actual answer behind why or to what purpose these carbines were manufactured. But it's important to know it was made out of a 9130. These were full-length rifles that had the barrel shortened, uh, new front sight uh, base installed, the rear sight 
uh, leaf was modified to remove some markings on it and there were some other changes made here and there and I think the official number is 35,000 of these things were manufactured although because there's really no consensus about even where they were made or why I don't know where that number comes from and who knows another warehouse might open up and a hundred thousand more of these things might flood into the country I don't think it's fraudulent I don't think it was done up by some importer um, but I do believe we're not going to know what it actually was uh, probably not in my lifetime I don't think any uh, trove of documents is going to be forthcoming to tell us exactly what these things are but it's still a pretty interesting little carbine some of the work that was done to it is kind of ingenious and it has some neat interesting unusual features so let's go over to the tabletop or the bench top and take a closer look at this thing and I'll give you my thoughts on it uh, even if I don't have any definitive answers so let's go do it so now let's take a closer look at this controversial little carbine. As you can see, it's still clear, nothing in the mag, nothing up the tube. So the carbine is safe for the purposes of this examination. I'm not going to go into excruciating detail looking at every little tiny feature of the carbine. And the reason for that is that this thing is, at its core, essentially an Arsenal refinished M9130 rifle albeit one that's been shortened considerably to uh, bring it into line with carbine standards. Uh, and most of the work was done very, very nicely. You can see how the end of the stock was cut here. The barrel was turned down very nicely. The machining on that is nicer than the machining on the outside of the wartime production barrel. Uh, it has a really nice crown put on it. And overall, the work that was done was, was really done pretty nicely. Um, I have it outfitted with a wartime production sling, and this is an M9130. This is the rifle length sling, not the carbine length sling. As you can see, I've got it shortened all the way, and there's still quite a bit of play in there. Most rifles and carbines were outfitted with this type of sling when they went through the Arsenal refurbishment uh, program. Now, that was just after World War II. I have no idea what type of sling would have been appropriate for a carbine done up in 1959, but this one works fairly well. I used to have bales of these things, and unfortunately, I've sold most of them off. Um, but anyway, this one works perfectly fine. Uh, it's the typical mishmash of parts. Of course, all of the numbers match because that was part of the Arsenal refurbishment program was to make sure that all the parts fit properly, and then if they didn't have a matching bolt for a receiver and a barrel, uh, the numbers were force matched. So, of course, everything matches, and I'm sure everything works perfectly well mechanically. I'm not sure if I've ever actually shot this rifle or not. Probably the first main difference you'll notice about one of these things, um, other than the fact that it's in a shortened rifle stock, is that instead of fitting a carbine uh, rear sight base to the barrel, they've simply modified the rifle length rear sight base. Um, they actually haven't modified the rear sight base at all. Well, they did install the pins if they weren't already there, these extra barrel pins. What they really modified was the rear sight leaf. As you can see, this is a full length leaf, and it has about half of its uh, graduations uh, still in place on the rear sight. Now, for whatever reason, everything above a thousand meters was milled off on both sides. They just went in there with an end mill, I guess, and just milled those sections out before re-bluing everything. And I don't really know what the purpose was behind that. Um, the graduations from uh, 100 meters to a thousand meters haven't been changed at all. They're exactly the same as they were on the rifle sight. Now, taking into account that the barrel has been shortened considerably, and therefore the sight radius has shortened considerably, and the fact that uh, the standard ammunition coming out of a, a short 20-inch barrel, I think this is 20 and a quarter or something like that inch barrel, is going to be a lot slower at the muzzle than that coming out of the 28 
plus inch barrel on the 9130 rifle. So what that means is all of these graduations are going to be wrong anyway. The individual soldier might be able to shoot the rifle and determine for themselves uh, what marking is correct at which, which range, but I, these are basically meaningless anyway. So why they would go ahead and mill everything above a thousand off, I have no idea. Um, perhaps it was to discourage people from trying to shoot this thing at long range. It has all the hallmarks to me, all the uh, characteristics of a typical Soviet communist make work project. This was busy work that was done to um, put arsenal workers to a task that would take up time and keep them employed. I can't imagine what else the purpose was for milling these graduation marks off the rear sight. Particularly when you consider that the, as I've already pointed out, the graduations that are left there aren't gonna really be correct anyway. So that's one major change. Um, now this was originally, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see the marks very well, this was originally an Izhevsk 9130. You can see the Izhevsk uh, arsenal mark there. And it was originally made in 1943, which you may or may not be able to see, right in the middle of the war. But where it would have said 9130, the markings have been replaced with 1891 slash 59. So a lot of times these are referred to as 9159, but I think technically it's an 189159. Why they included the 18 at the beginning, I have absolutely no idea. And some people have used that as an indication uh, to sort of justify the original idea that these things were made maybe in Bulgaria, because that really doesn't fit the Soviet um, style model coding system, I guess is the best way to put it. So anyway, most of the modifications that were made to the carbine happened in front of the rear sight base. Well, in front of the barrel shank anyway. So I am going to set this down as far to the left of the frame as possible. And now I'm going to bring a completely unmodified M9130 rifle into the frame so that I can show you just how extensive all of this work that was performed to the carbine was. So this is, I think, the best way to illustrate just how much work would have been involved in converting an M9130 rifle, like this one, into an M9159 carbine, like this one. As I already said, some collectors have speculated that the Model 9159 carbine doesn't date from 1959 at all, but rather that it was made in uh, maybe the, the late 1990s or the early 2000s by some less than scrupulous entrepreneurial spirits, I guess would be a nice way to put it. Maybe in Ukraine, maybe in... Uh, Russia, maybe, maybe in Bulgaria for all we know. And the idea was that these people were hoping that they could convert stockpiles of relatively low value 9130 rifles into some new and heretofore unheard of carbine variant that would command a premium price on the surplus market. But as I also already said, I was around when they were importing these 9159s. I, m I might have bought this one directly from Century International. Uh, I might have got it from SOG. I might have got it from AIM Surplus. But I definitely bought this from a distributor. And they were charging a premium for these over unconverted rifles. But the, the price premium to get a 9159 was maybe $10, maybe $20. It wasn't some exorbitant amount of money. I wouldn't have paid to buy this rifle if it was way, way more expensive than a 9130. And it certainly wasn't enough of a premium to uh, make it cost effective, to justify all of the work that has to go into converting that rifle into this carbine. People were speculating that they were just taking a hacksaw and cutting off the barrel and then clamping up the stock in a miter box and hacking that off. And presto bammo, you've got a carbine. But it's nowhere near so simple as all of that. Um, as I already pointed out, this barrel has a very nice crown on it. Um, 
the muzzle has to be turned down to accept a front sight base. And this, incidentally, is not an M38 front sight base, I do not believe. I think this is a completely new item that was made up specifically for the 9159. And even, let's just say we're talking about 35,000 rifles. That's quite an endeavor to set up production of a front sight base for 35,000 rifles if you're just trying to make a couple of bucks here and there. Um, they may have used M38 carbine cleaning rods. I think actually this is an M9130 cleaning rod that's been cut down. It's been re-threaded at the end. And then the whole thing's been re-arsenal, arsenal refinished and re-blued. Um, so you do shorten the stock and you can see the front of this end cap falls right around the middle of the sling of scotch in there. I, I don't know that I've ever had this end cap off, but I imagine if I did take it off, that slot would be filled in with a block of wood. Then you've got to fit the end cap. As you can see, it wasn't just hammered on there. We've got a nice bevel here. This thing was turned, the, the stock was turned down to accept uh, the front cap and then a screw that's got to be drilled and screwed. Um, I don't believe this is an M38 handguard. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't even think it's a shortened 9130 handguard. I believe um, this the stock is birch. This is beech. The handguard looks brand new. It looks like that was manufactured completely. So you had to manufacture a handguard, manufacture end caps. Um, the rear barrel band and retainer, those can stay pretty much as they are. But as I already pointed out, the front sling escutcheon is right about where the end cap is. In order to get that back here, you've got to inlet a hole all the way through the stock. And then this one has a pressed metal, sort of a late war style escutcheon that goes through and is bent over. But that's a fair amount of work. Then you've got to move the front, the front barrel band back to here. And now your barrel band retainer has to be inlet into the stock. So that's not just drilling a hole, it's also inletting a channel here. So I mean, all of that, it adds up. I can't imagine even in late 1990s Bulgaria or Ukraine or Russia that they were so impoverished and labor rates were so cheap that you could have possibly done all of this work uh, to make an extra 10 bucks, 20 bucks on a rifle. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so I definitely think this was a government project. I think to a large degree, it was a make work project, just like the milling of the rear sights. I think the whole thing was done. I mean, it might have been made in anticipation of uh, the Cold War turning into a hot war, and they were just going to need every possible rifle they could get their hands on to fight this World War III that was coming. Um, but I have a feeling this all of this, and I don't care where it was done. I don't care if it was done in the Ukraine. I don't care if it was done in Bulgaria. I don't care if it was done in Russia um, or anywhere else in the Black Sea region. Um, this the whole thing just doesn't make any sense to me. And I think, that, of course, that's why there's been so much speculation about the carbine. An interesting thing to note is because this barrel is a cut-down 9130 barrel, um, the 9130 barrel is tapered another 8 inches past the uh, muzzle of this gun. So, as I already pointed out, they had to turn it down to get this front sight base on it. But as a result... The barrel profile of this carbine is probably the heaviest and stiffest because um, the taper is ending here now instead of eight inches out. But you end up with an almost a bull barrel, very heavy profile, much heavier than the M38. And as a result, this ends up being short and stiff. And we know that short and stiff barrels are uh, one of the ingredients to an accurate rifle. Uh, again, I'm not sure if I've ever shot this one, but it has a very nice bore. Uh, we definitely will be shooting it soon. And I'm actually anticipating this being fairly accurate. Now, as I pointed out before, we're going to really have to uh, kind of try to figure out those rear sights and, uh, and learn what the graduations mean, because this thing's going to be completely off from the way it was calibrated 
when the rifle was manufactured at Izhevsk in 1943. But anyway, I still think these are pretty cool. I think they're a fun carbine. And actually, when you really start looking at them up close, yes, it's just an Arsenal Refinish 9130, but the work that was done was actually really quite nice. And um, I don't know, even if it's fraudulent, I'm not sorry that I own this carbine. I'm definitely going to be keeping this one, and uh, we're definitely going to be shooting it this summer. So I don't think I have a whole lot else to contribute. Let's move back to the bookshelves and wrap this up. So the 9159 carbine is an interesting variant of the uh, Mosin Nagant 9130 rifle. Um, I don't think it's something to shy away from if you're thinking about purchasing a Mosin Nagant carbine. I, I think they're legitimate. Um, it's interesting in that it wasn't just Arsenal refinished, it was completely remanufactured. Why they were made, by whom, uh, and for what purpose, I don't think we'll ever know. But it is a cool carbine, and I think it's a worthwhile thing to add to your collection. This one happens to be in really excellent condition. The bore is very nice, and we're definitely going to be shooting this in an upcoming video uh, in the near future, as well as the uh, Spanish Civil War veteran 9130 that was in the last video. So I hope this has proved enlightening to somebody or helpful. I don't know how helpful it could be since I don't really have any answers, but I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider becoming a subscriber. It goes a long way to help keep me here on the tube. If you're already a subscriber, click the little bell icon down below. That'll allow YouTube to send you notifications when I post new content to the channel. Uh, like, share, tell your friends. And when I post some new videos, I hope to see each of you here then. Later, guys.